Very few historical figures have the bloody legacy of the man known as Vlad Zepesh the Third of Wallachia. Now that that's rolls a long the, name. That rolls off the tongue nicely. But most people nowadays would know him as Vlad Dracula or Vlad the Impaler, a bloodthirsty warlord and folk hero. Folk hero in today's society over people, there for sure. People in, in that region remember him as quite a just ruler. So you know, we're going to talk about the blood, but we're going to talk about the man who shed all that blood. We're going to talk about Vlad the Impaler tonight. From a child born into this world, we are taught what to believe. Close-minded, we become fearful to be deceived. Still, we desire to know what lies beyond that locked door. The art of the storyteller conjuring tales of legend and lore. History hidden, lost knowledge, things forgotten, and the unknown. These are the things that direct us and will set the tone. Welcome, friends, to another episode of Nightmares on the Lost Highway. Eric, you and I, long time... Movie buffs, I know you've seen Dracula and Tom oh, Stoker's Dracula. I don't have enough fingers to count. <laughs> all, all these different iterations of Dracula. You have the Marvel Comics Dracula. You have the DC Comics Dracula, the fought Batman. Um, Dracula is, he, he, he's everywhere. Eternal. and <laughs> Eternal, yeah. <laughs> I mean, well, in more than one way. But what some people, I think most people now know that obviously Dracula was inspired by Vlad the Impaler. Or like I said, you know, Vlad Zepesh the Third of Wallachia, you know, but he he was not a vampire that we're aware of. He was a a savage warlord. Let's say that a a conqueror, a a commander uh, unparalleled. I, I kind of put him up there with like Attila the Hun, kind of. Yeah, I, I mean, mean, he's he was. You better not be in his way. Yeah, I don't want to say monstrous, but yeah, you didn't want to cross Vlad the Impaler. So tonight. As we talk about this, as we go through this, we're probably going to say Vlad Zepesh. We'll probably say Vlad the Impaler. We'll probably say Dracula. All three of those names are going to reference the same man. To go into a little background, Dracula was probably born sometime between 1428 and 1431. Uh, records at that time were a little spotty, let's be honest. <laughs> uh, somewhere in the region of Sifisoyora, Transylvania. Transylvania now, uh, of course, Romania, that, that right. region. And it, of course, steeped in, in history and folklore. I mean, they had vampire stories going way back. Um, diplomatic reports from the 15th century indicate that he was using that name fairly early, the name Dracula. He himself would sign letters using that name in, in the 1470s, which would have been towards the end of his life. Dracula translates literally to son of the dragon in the local language. Uh, in modern Romanian, Dracul means the devil. So, uh, eventually, Vlad Zepesh III would become known as Vlad the Impaler, uh, being, you know, taking that name after one of his favorite methods of execution. The Turkish, or the Ottomans, called him Kaziklu Bey, which translated to the Impaling Prince. And, for, for just reasons. Yeah. Some estimates say he was responsible for more than 80,000 deaths in his lifetime. And I now, found I, I found I, that number varies a lot, but oh, it was yeah. definitely in the well, thousands of thousands. Yeah, and I'm sure those deaths weren't by his hand alone. You know, he, he again, he was a leader of armies. He was a leader of men. He was a conqueror. Now, Vlad was the second of four sons born to Vlad II Dracul. Uh, Vlad II used the name Dracul for his membership in the Order of the Dragon. Uh, this was a militant order founded by the Holy Roman Emperor Sigismund, and it was to defend Christian Europe against the Ottoman Empire. Now, the Ottomans come up a whole lot in, in our, our reading here. Uh, at the time, that was the Muslim Empire. So to give you an idea of, of the people that he was fighting in the regions and the areas that he would be in. And literally, the area that, that was his domain was kind of right smack dab in the middle of a war field. There was the north yes. and the south, and they're just kind of their own little thing right there in the middle well we're yeah we're going to talk a lot about wallachia yeah which was located between christian europe and the muslim land, lands of the ottoman empire so yes he was his his kingdom was right there like disputed territory constantly uh now vlad ii seized wallachia after the death of his half-brother in 1436 
Uh, again, like I just said, you know, Malaysia was located right smack dab between Christian Europe and the Muslim lands of the Ottoman Empire. So it often found itself the scene of frequent bloody battles as the Ottoman Empire pushed westward trying to conquer Christian lands. And again, I'm not taking religious sides here. I'm just, this right. is history. This is just history. Uh, Vlad II did not support the Ottoman invasions of Transylvania, obviously. At a certain point, Sultan Murad II ordered him to come to Gallipoli so he could demonstrate loyalty to the Ottomans. Now, why did he go? Uh, you know, who knows? But he went, Vlad Dracul, and he took his two sons, Vlad III and his younger brother, Radu. They were all captured by the Sultan. Uh, Vlad II was released under the condition that his children would remain there with the Sultan. If you watch Game of Thrones, you know, they were warded or whatever. Yes. Like, you give me your kids, and I know you won't turn your back You're on gonna me. You're going to be loyal, and this is yeah. why. I got your kids. And so... Eventually, Vlad II was, would side with uh, Vladislaus, which was the king of Poland and Hungary, against the Ottoman Empire, and he really did like have concern for the lives of his children at that point. He figured his boys' lives were forfeit; they were going to be killed. You know, the I think in his own words, they were going to be butchered for the sake of Christian peace. That sounds lovely. Um, now, the Sultan harmed neither boy, even after their father rebelled against him. And at a certain point, Vlad II would again acknowledge the Sultan's rule of Wallachia. Now, John Hunyadi, regent governor of Hungary, invaded Wallachia in 1447. Uh, at this point in time, Vlad and Radu must have been back with their father because it is said that Vlad and Radu fled to the Ottoman Empire. Obviously, they knew people in the Ottoman Empire. They, they knew the Sultan, so... I actually, in my research, and again, it's so far back, history, yeah, it, history is hard not to document. well documented, but I, I showed that they were probably imprisoned uh, there for about 17 years. I mean, so a good portion of, a, especially a young boy's life, and uh, Radu, his uh, Vlad's brother, this is kind of a touchy subject, but I found several documentations that proved that this John uh, Hunyadi, yeah, maybe struck a sexual affection towards Radu, the son. <laughs> and that just infuriated Vlad even more. Yeah. But Vlad went back to his homeland, and I had that Radu kind of stayed back, at least for a while. Well, and, and also, during their time with the Ottomans, they taught Radu and Vlad, you know, the arts of combat and stuff like that. They taught Vlad to lead men. They taught him to be a conqueror. They yeah. taught him to be a soldier. It wasn't like they were just locked away in a tower yeah, or something. They, they were taken cell. care of and, and, you know, taught the things. Educated. And, and they, they would need to you know, know. Politics and war and everything. So after Vlad and Radu fled to the Ottoman Empire, Vlad Dracul and his eldest son, Mircea, were murdered. And uh, Hunyadi made Vladislav II, which was the son of Vlad Dracul's cousin, ruler of Wallachia. Well, obviously, this doesn't sit well with with Vlad the Impaler there, Vlad not Dracula. At, not at all. Because these are his lands. These are his ancestral lands. This is where his family's from. This is where they've ruled for, you know, at least a generation. So with his father and his older brother gone, Vlad becomes the claimant to the, the seat of Wallachia. He's the rightful ruler at this point. So now he begins a series of lifelong campaigns to regain his father's seat. And his opponents would include the boyars, which were sort of the aristocrat class in, in that region. And they kind of ruled things regionally, like governors, or if you will. Uh, and also his younger brother was the youngest brother, the fourth brother, which I don't remember. I think it was like Vlad the Monk or something like that. Yeah, yep. Uh, he, he also was trying to claim his father's throne, which, again, according to succession, Vlad being the eldest, uh, eldest surviving son, it would have gone to him. Uh, his younger brother was actually supported by the uh, Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, so he had pretty substantial backing. Now, Vlad was victorious briefly in 1448, but he's removed from power after only two months. Yeah, very short-lived. Yeah. And then after another eight years, Vlad again claimed uh, the Vovodate, so the Voivoda, the, the warlord, the conqueror. I think it's it's basically a military yeah. leadership kind of thing. They had a lot of strange titles. I mean, I say strange, but at least for the American well, for version, us. for us, it sounds strange. And there's a <laughs> lot of names and titles that. During Vlad's rule, many sources say that hundreds and even thousands of people were executed under Vlad's orders. Now, what many people don't know, and this is what we're going to delve into a little bit, is that apparently Vlad was very, he was a very strong believer in justice. Vlad was a just ruler. Now, again, very, very feared. He was a torturer. He was a murderer. But he believed in justice. As ruler of Wallachia, he undertook a campaign to clean the country up. He wanted, he wanted it to be a good place to live. So 
You know, they, they went on a campaign to eliminate thieves, murderers, rapists, and beggars. Well, that last one seems a little... <laughs> the riffraff. I, I get the riff others. Riff. But yeah, his methods were extreme, and this caused him to become one of the most feared slash loved rulers of all time in that region. That's a fine line to tread. Yeah. There's one story about a golden cup that was in a public fountain, and anyone could use the cup to drink from the fountain. It was there publicly. There was no guard, no one to defend it. No one would dare steal that cup while Vlad was in power. Uh, another anecdote is uh, when he wanted to test the honesty of one of his noblemen. So he had a man steal 50 gold coins fr- from this noble. And the next day, the noble came to Vlad and he complained and he said, hey, somebody stole 100 coins from me. <laughs> and Vlad's like, well, no, I know they only stole 50. So Vlad, right there on the spot, calls him out, calls him a greedy liar, and then has him executed by, by impaling him. He, he was... All righty then. Again, he was into justice. He yeah. was a good man. He was a, a good, honest. I mean, he was harsh, but they, they say he was a very fair ruler. Uh, so di- also during this time, of course, he begins a purge against the boyars who had participated in the murder of his father and brother. Oh boy, did he. And, and anyone else suspected of plotting against him. Uh, let me jump in if I could with this part. This, this story, uh, Antidote, was, was quite interesting to me. This is... This will kind of give you a, a key piece of kind of how he thinks and how he deals with problems. The, the boyards, as Bill was saying, you know, Vlad is still trying to make sure that he's not overthrowed like he served for only a few months before. And the boyards keep, they're just kind of right there under the skin, just kind of festering. So he decides that he's going to um, throw this big party, if you will. And he would invite, uh, I found 500 of the boyards with their wives and children to an inaugural celebration there at his palace. And after a day of great festivities and and good times, Prince Vlad ordered all of his guests to be captured and killed by impalement outside of his palace. Uh, Now, to set the tone that, you know, he was not to be trifled with. um, Impalement, you know, we talked about that a little bit. It's it's a um, a lost art, if you will. (laughs) You say lost art Uh, as if we want to bring it back. Yeah, yeah. It's similar to a, a crucifixion, but not really. Oh, no. It's, um, it's a very painful death, but as it was written, a very practical death. A sharpened wood post, and I'm going to get a little graphic. Not always. Not okay. always sharpened. Not always. Sometimes dull. <laughs> a, blint, a, a blunted post was sometimes used because it would prolong the experience. Oh, we're getting this down to it would a not, science. It would not damage the internal organs. Well, this wooden post uh, would be greased often with lard or fat and entered up through the anal cavity. Up uh, again. Not all. I mean, they... they you, oftentimes used a natural <laughs> opening, but sometimes they made their own. <laughs> a natural opening. I lo- okay. <laughs> <clears throat> Stuck up in some area yes. of the anal area or region, and then it would be basically just forced up through. It might come up through the throat, the mouth. It might be the chest, through the ribs. Again, you, know, you what, might, you might use the natural exit. Or you know, And I'm imagining this, this person is probably not holding still for this. So, you know, I say art. Literally, it's, you know, whichever way they're turning. And then this person would be literally just left to writhe in pain and agony and, until and, they're dead. And it, yeah, it could take days depending days. on the trauma. The the blunted stakes, yes, the process definitely took days. Sharpened stakes usually punctured internal organs. You could die within hours, right? If you were lucky, I well, guess. Well, if it punctured a certain internal organ or whatever. Now Vlad kept these bodies up uh, often to the point of decay. You know, you can envision ravens and other birds and beasts would come and feed upon the bodies. Uh, I was described and written, uh, recorded that he himself would often have special dinner tables brought out uh, among his horrific forest of corpses. He would would dine among the screaming and paled victims. Uh, And some tells say he would even dip his bread in the dripping blood. There's actually a sketch that shows like one of his servants with like a a bowl gathering some blood and he, he would dip like his bread in it. And now that's. That's a little sadistic, uh, a little crazy, but they, they said this is where hundreds and thousands literally would make a forest of dead corpses around. Now, you talk about sending a statement. Wow. Oh, I'll, I'll get into that a little bit later. There's, there's some anecdotes. Wow. Now, of course, Vlad, in his wisdom, he never did forget the Ottomans. 
when a diplomatic envoy was sent to have audience with Vlad in 1459, uh, he, he invited them to eat with him, you know, have a meal with him and sit down and, and enjoy a meal. And as was custom in Wallachia, you would remove your hat to eat dinner. Uh, now, of course, the diplomats refused to remove their turbans for religious reasons. And Vlad stood up and, and with a grin on his face, he's like, gentlemen. You know, I, I commend your religious devotion. I appreciate the fact that you, you dedicate yourself so so fervently to your beliefs. Uh, and now, to ensure that you never have to remove your hats again, had his servants come forward and with three nails apiece, nailed the turbans to the different to the men's heads. Now, see, I'm seeing like uh, old mobster movie type here. This is the mob boss, and, and he's got all of his people sitting around this table, and he's walking around behind each one yeah. of them, you know. And I mean, wow. Wow. Yeah. And and of course, as we've touched on before, he was known to be a savage commander in battle. One of my one of my favorite kind of stories that I found, and I say favorite, I mean it's still a bloody horrible story. Uh was during one one battle, uh that kind of started on June seventeenth, fourteen sixty two, and it was known as the night attack at, at Targovist. And Vlad's army launched a night attack on Ottoman for forces marching towards Targovist. Vlad's army and the Ottoman army fought from three hours after sunset until four in the morning. Historians estimate that Vlad lost 5,000 men in this battle, and that's that's quite a few. Yeah. The Ottomans lost 15,000. <laughs> so Vlad gave every bit as good as he, he, he could, you know. Uh, what was it? That's three three Ottomans to every one of Vlad's people. And this battle today is, is still celebrated in Romanian literature and folklore. However, this did not deter the Ottoman army. You would think that'd be enough. Right. But they continued to march towards Targovist. Well, as they approached the city of Targovist... Vlad had left behind a field filled with as many as 23,000 impaled victims. They say they were lined up for as far as 60 miles in, in, in all directions. Pretty intimidating. Yeah. Uh, well, it was intended to deter the advancement of the Ottoman forces. And when the Sultan saw it, he, he, he saw this. And the Sultan uh, at the time was known as a horrible, you know, torturous man himself at that point in time. And he was just horrified at what he saw in his own words. The Sultan said to his soldiers, how can we despoil of his estates a man who is not afraid to defend it by such means as these? And the Ottoman forces turn around and march back to Constantinople the next day. I mean, he, he was like, what can we do to this, this guy? Yeah, yeah. So afterwards, Vlad wrote to one of his allies, I have killed peasants, men and women, old and young, who live at Obluxitsa and Novosela where the Danube flows into the sea. We killed 23,884 Turks, without counting those whom we burned in their homes or the Turks whose heads were cut off by our soldiers. Thus, your highness, you must know that I have broken the peace. <laughs> yeah, uh, think? I mean, Vlad, just, man. He, now. At least you knew where you stood with him. Yeah. I yeah. mean, there was, <laughs> there was no doubt. Now, Vlad had detailed court chroniclers. And so, to give you an idea, I, here, here is a, a rough count of the impaled in in vlad's time and i'm gonna say these city names I, i'm not from that region of the world i'm gonna get them wrong the court chroniclers say that at that point in time 1350 ottoman uh, ottomans were impaled uh later on 6840 would be impaled at Durstor katal and dripotram 630 at tutukaya 6414 at girgu 1460 at rehova 749 at Novigrad and Sistavica, 210 at Merotiu. And he did not discriminate. Male, yeah. female, Women, old and young, children. he did not care. Yep. He was, he, he used it as much to make a point as to, you know, punish his, his enemies. So later that same year, 1462, he escapes Ottomans only to be captured by Hungarian forces. Uh, and he's imprisoned by Matthias I of Hungary, which... You know, at one point in time, he was allied with Hungary, and then now he's being captured by Hungary. Now, I think somewhere along this point, you know, they, they'd come in and, and Vlad actually retreated before he was captured. And uh, to kind of give this military standpoint of him, he realized that he was going to be on the run and he was going to lose the battle. His days were numbered. He set fires to his own country's fields, burned towns, burned cities poisoned wells. I mean, basically it was to the point, look, if, if you're going to beat me, you're not going to have anything left of value. Yeah, again, I'm going to take it all with me. Savage and brutal. He spends 14 years as a prisoner of Matthias, only for Matthias to eventually recognize him as the lawful prince of Wallachia. <laughs> uh, he was set free, regained his seat in 1476. 
but would be killed in battle that same year. He was with a small vanguard of his soldiers, and they would be ambushed. He would be killed and beheaded, and his head sent to the Sultan as a trophy. Now, uh, since then, he has remained a folk hero in the region, the Transylvania, uh, now Romania. Uh, as, for his efforts against the Ottoman Empire, he's, he's viewed as legendary. Uh, and a folk statues hero. and everything, yeah. And, you know, if you look at the art, you know, he, was, he would have been a striking man if the art is accurate. He definitely looked like a conqueror, his big, thick mustache and jet black hair hanging down to his shoulders. And he's legendary. I mean, again, we, we still talk about him today, irregardless of the fact that we associate him with the Dracula story, which I think you're going to go into. Yes. But, you know, Vlad the Impaler is known as a, a conquering warlord that, that from you know, his- again, a just man. From a historical standpoint, I mean, I, I think I read somewhere where they said uh, this character, the history, the story of Dracula, Vlad, has probably been on more stage plays, motion pictures, and books right up there, probably close to secondary to the Bible kind of but, thing. I mean, it's But when uncanny. we say that, though, we're talking about the story of Dracula, which is yes, not necessarily not the story of Vlad the Impaler. Vlad. Exactly. So we're going to, I think we're going to roll the story roll uh, of Dracula in here and and. We're going to associate the two and we're going to connect the dots in as much as that the name Dracula definitely inspired fear and that name would eventually be used. How, how did Louis put it in the demented ramblings of a drunken Irishman <laughs> in an inter- interview with a vampire? We can't, I, I don't believe, talk about in this podcast, uh, you know, Dracula without talking about Bram Stoker. Now, since, the, since it was first published in 1897, Bram Stoker's book Dracula has become one of the world's most popular and frightening works of fiction. And I, I will say it's a fantastic read. If, if you've not read it and you're into reading, not everybody is. But I think Dracula is, is one of the, the great classic horror literature pieces. I absolutely agree with you. This best-selling horror novel has been kept in constant publication for over a hundred years. I mean, that kind of sets the precedence itself to what we were talking about. Now, a- another key character with this whole story is uh, the stage play star Bella Lugosi. Absolutely, has stereotyped in the movie genre the character as more of a charming yet formidable character since its first adaption. The visual appearance of the character Dracula owes much of the stage play, much to the stage play actor Bella Lugosi, with his swab attire and charming portrayal. However, Bram Stoker's original character was more frightening and sinister by most accounts. A demon with sharp fanged teeth and grotesque features, more associated with decay and hideous appearance. But at the same time, he would have had the ability to pass amongst normal people. Um, so he could appear as a nobleman of, of some standing. When he would drink blood, he yeah. would gain that youth and refreshment, if you will, uh, to be able to, yes, pass with society. Dracula, simply put, is a dead man who must consume blood of the living to survive, and in doing so, recruits others into his ranks of the undead. Well, I, I think most people would have understood vampire there. So. Y- yes. <laughs> so we're going to talk a little bit more about Bram Stoker. The author and creator, uh, I believe, was destined to create this character of Dracula, much out of his own early childhood and infatuation with the dead. Stoker was born November 8th, 1847, in a town not too far from Dublin, Ireland. Uh, This was the same time frame you must remember as the Great Irish Potato Famine. So during the 1840s, Ireland's population was around 8 million, give or take. And during that Great Irish Potato Famine, over 1.5 million died of starvation and disease. Now, those that did not die, you may say the lucky or unlucky ones, were often seen wandering the city streets, resembling literally the walking dead themselves. But while all of this was going on outside the young boy's nice established household, Brahm would not be able to see it personally. This was due to him being bedridden with a strange disease that had left the young boy paralyzed for the first seven years of his life. Now, Brahm's mother was kind of customary for her to sit by her son's bedside, especially at night, and tell him stories. But these bedtime stories were often the tragic events of what was going on outside, because as a young boy being confided, wanted to know what was going on, and the mom did her best to kind of relay that to her son since he was unable to view a lot of it himself. And it wasn't a good time, as I was stating with the Irish potato famine. Now, they would 
these stories would be melded a little bit with tales of legend and lore, but also the mom seemed to have kind of a knack to pass down horror stories from her own childhood. Now, this is kind of the old bedtime nursery tales. <laughs> uh, definitely, you know, it was a different time. We'll just leave it at that. It was a different time. The young boy continued to ask what was going on outside, and, and literally, if he could have got to the windows, it might have been a scene similar to The Walking Dead with people just rambling, starva- starving, disease-ridden, you know, going through the alleys, trying to find food. Uh, just a horrific time. Now, miraculously, this strange disease that had paralyzed the boy for seven years just, like, vanished. It wasn't a, a treatment or a medicine or anything, just kind of went away. So the boy started to regain his strength and after seven years began to grow stronger and stronger and begin to be able to walk and eventually play like a normal child. So what did the young boy do, you might ask? Well, just outside of the doorstep to his home was an adjacent cemetery. Now, it is said that he much loved to play among the gravestones for hours and hours. Now, this cemetery was not just a regular cemetery. Oh, no, no. This one had been created for the lost souls who committed suicide and were commonly not permitted to be buried in the church graveyards. So it kind of adds a, a even more demented twist to things. As Stoker grew into an adult, he seemed to tuck away his fetish for the dead and the morbid and found himself attending college and taking a job as a civil servant. In 1878, he married and moved to London, taking a job as a theater manager for the renowned stage actor Henry Irving. He loved the theater, but was even more taken by his love of writing, mostly of romantic adventures. But he seemed to always fall back on what he deeply loved the most, his infatuation for the dead. In 1882, he wrote Under the Sunset. This was a collection of short horror stories for, again, children. Okay, where do I sign up? In one of these stories, he wrote about a strange shadowy giant that plagued the city. In another one of the short stories, it was a character called the King of Death. You can kind of see where I'm going with this. At the time, only a handful of vampire stories had even been written. The most well-known by far would have been Varney the Vampire in uh, a British magazine serial. Just a little personal anecdote. I tried to read Varney the Vampire. (laughs) Because I was, uh, of course, fascinated with vampire stuff when I was in high school and and just right after high school. Uh, You know, interview the vampire, all that. I mean, anything I can get my hands on. I found a digital copy of Varney the Vampire. Which sounds so sinister. Varney. (laughs) Oh, man. It is is a product of its time. It is written in a style that as a modern reader, you will struggle with. Hard to connect. And the words that they use. I had... I mean, no joke. I was probably, for every page that I read, I had to look up at least one word. Because oh, I'm wow. like, I don't know what that thing is. A beadle, B-E-A-D-L-E, which is apparently a, a low-ranking member of the church. I, I didn't know what that was. You You're know, thinking I had a, to, a crunchy insect. Yeah, I had to look that up. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, Varney the Vampire. And, and there may have been one other story, which I believe was the the Carmilla. Carmilla, yes. The female vampire character. And, and, and again, that, that's, an, a, you know, again, product of its time and all that. That was Dracula, published in 1872. Yeah, Dracula holds up surprisingly well compared to those. <laughs> <laughs> well, Brahm had set off. He decided to write his own vampire story, uh, starting by looking into folk to, uh, folklore tales in the spring of 1890. Uh, now, this would become his most famed work that we're all talking about tonight, which would be Dracula. He was a stickler for detail, as many authors are, uh, but he spanned his research from the libraries of England all the way to Ireland, where he researched for seven years before actually starting to pen the book Dracula. In his version, the story would be made more modern, including such aspects as new technology for the time, uh, instruments such as the dictaphone, the typewriter, and telling the story of an ancient vampire who was struggling to some degree in a strange new world of modern creations that he was not accustomed to. Well, and like you said, he did a lot of research. So his version of the vampire was based heavily on the Eastern European vampire folklore. So you you have some of these vampire traditions of not being able to cross running water, Mm-hmm. Uh, having to sleep in earth from his own Stakes grave. in the heart. Stake so. in the heart, repulsed by garlic, things like that. 
Yeah, I mean, he he really did take the time to seven re- years to review the traditions of and, and folklore of the region before he, you know, committed to writing the story. Now, he he went on record and he said ultimately the story he felt was the story of a society in transition. Never really thought about that. I mean, I'm just I, I love Dracula, I love vampires, that lore. But if you strip away all of that. It was. It was an ancient vampire struggling to find his way in a new world of technology. So, in an interview with a vampire, you know, and and Rice, you know, what rest it, in peace. It, that's kind of the same thing that that Louis and and Lestat are all trying to kind of conquer. I think it's always been sort of a common thread of vampire literature, though, with them being eternal and having to come to grips with the change, changing world that they live in. And again, it, it's let, let's be honest. In our own way, every person can identify with with the changing world that they live in yeah I, i'm not gonna live for hundreds of years but you know i remember music starting with a record and 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 proceeding to eight track and cassette even in my own lifetime mm-hmm. to now a click of a button on your phone, on your phone. and you have access to the musical libraries of the world and for some people that stuff can be very daunting you know luckily i'm you know, someone who embraces technology and embraces change, but even even on in my own way, you know, I I still like the feeling of paper in my hand when I read a book. That's not to say I don't read electric books. I mean, that's unfortunately it becomes more and more common. We're going to have to read that way. Yeah, but there's still nothing like holding a book in your hand. You know, so that you, even for me, there there's some things that I'm I'm having a hard time transitioning to. Absolutely. Now his novel kind of struck a chord with the staunch Victorian society of the time. It was a time when the theater allowed his story to help satisfy the audience's lust for what we now call as gothic fiction. And this was probably one of the very first books that would fall in that category. Dracula himself was never a handsome man, but more of an animalistic nature, a frail old man who had become younger by drinking of the blood. Now, again, we're talking about Dracula, not necessarily Vlad. Uh, you know, for inspiration. Uh, he, of course, could not write about sexuality in the book, especially during these staunch Victorian times. Now, I mean, again, to read Dracula, he couldn't write directly about those things, but they are definitely alluded to. Absolutely. He's writing about them. And He's just writing about them the, the way he could. That's what I'm touching on. Instead, he presented the charm of a vampire as a mysterious curse, which would lure women in, that very seductive. The biting of the neck was his representation of sexuality, uh, as close as he could to present it with the sternness, again, of the Victorian era. Uh, You must remember that just two years before his book was released and during the seven-year research period, a similar animalistic creature brought London and the world to fear. And we've talked about Jack the Ripper quite often on our podcast. Similar to Jack the Ripper, Dracula would hunt his prey at night under the cover of the moon and the shadows. He would often lure his victims, again, like Jack the Ripper, possibly down dark alleys and cobblestone streets. Now, as Brom Stoker continued the seven-year research, several things actually would go into his creation of Dracula. Uh, we've talked a lot about Vlad, obviously, was a key, key critical point, but well, there were others. I know he found the name, uh, and, and Dracula in the book is not necessarily the historical Dracula, you know, transformed into a vampire, but he found the name, and his, the, there's some handwritten notes of his where Dracula, he has Dracula equals devil. So it wasn't necessarily the association with, you know, Son of the Dragon and, and all that, but it was more of just the devilish evil aspect of, of just the name mm-hmm. that he was he, he he was attracted to i guess it would be the way to say it mm-hmm. so also we had jack the ripper that i just touched upon that could have played a, a part in that another one we have talked about in in past podcasts was elizabeth bothroy uh, who bathed in the blood of the young virgins we've got a podcast uh, actually talking quite a lot about her thirdly um was Adam's wife out of the Bible. Now, not Eve. Uh, Lilith. Yes. According to some Hebrew <laughs> scholars, Adam was tempted by his first wife, the first ever vampire, as some might say, in the Garden of Eden. Uh, Adam's first wife was Lilith. Uh, and in the book known as the Talbot, Adam 
had a wife before Eve, and, and that was her name was Lilith. Now, she challenged Adam for equality and fought uh, submission. Well, that's why we never hear about her. And stomp that out. You got that right. <laughs> now, Lilith believed they should be equals, and Adam demanded his wife be beneath him. So it, when it became evident that Adam was not going to go for this, Lilith left one evening, and it is said that she journeyed to the nearby seas. When she returned, she claimed to have demonic powers, and she attacked not only Adam, but also his now second wife, Eve, and their children. I was not familiar with this aspect growing up in the, the, the so, traditional Christian church. So here's the deal with that. I know that story, and, and you know, let me touch a chord here, from the role-playing game Vampire the Masquerade. Mm -hmm. and, and honestly, I'm, I've never been... It's never ceased to surprise me how much of the folklore of that game is inspired by biblical lore. Uh, in, in that particular game, Cain is actually the first vampire. And when Cain slays his brother Abel, uh, in the Bible, he's, giving an, he's given an undefined curse. In the, the world of Vampire the Masquerade, that curse is the curse of vampirism. But it does reference Lilith because some... Even within the realm of that world, there is a debate about the origins of vampires, and Lilith herself may have been the first vampire according to the lore of that game. So that is where I had heard at least hmm. part of that story. And then, of course, looking it up, you know, there there's some it's a good tie some in history there. And, and for all of our listeners, uh, Bill has played Vampire the Masquerade for for off and on for some time, and we, we're continuing to try to get him to lead a game for us. Oh, scheduling, Eric. We've talked about it, <laughs> and I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, I am a creature to, of the night myself. I don't mean to call you out, but I'm calling you out. <laughs> <laughs> well, moving on, uh, number four, in Greek mythology, and I'm going to probably butcher this name, but Bellon Miva was a female vampiric character who had several children with Zeus until they were captured by Hera, Zeus's well, wife. Zeus had children with everybody. Well, and, yeah, well yeah. and everything. He, he was so. frisky and he got around a lot. <laughs> but uh, Bellon Miva. Bilan Miva retreated in fear, but turned her focus to embrace her demonic powers, where it is said in legend and lore that she hunted other mother's children herself and drank their blood. Now, number five, there is a, in India a vampire goddess, uh, Kali. Now, that dates back to the 6th century. She had multiple arms, a snake-like tongue, and a mouthful of fangs that dripped blood. Number six, in Malaysia, the vampire-like creature in lore looked more like a giant mosquito in a shadow smoke form. It is said that uh, this creature would enter homes through the smallest of cracks and keyholes and feed upon the blood of infants while they slept with a long tongue that would extend for basically the length of its head. Number seven, Pathers was a feared in Japan. These were strange troll imp-like creatures that would lay in the waters of lakes and rivers and await victims to approach before attacking and pulling them into the water and drinking the blood of their victims. Uh, and number eight, in China, a vampiric creature known as the Shang-Chi. These were strong, vicious creatures, able to change into a wolf, would often rip the limbs from their victims of their prey. Number nine, in Aztec mythology, uh, they had their own version of a giant vampire-like bat that would greet the victims of the dead in the underworld. The Aztecs worshipped the real vampire bats themselves. And now, keep in mind, a vampire bat is actually a very small bat, but to put it into perspective, a colony of, say, 100 of these small bats could drain enough blood of a herd of 25 full-grown cattle. So they may have been little, but they actually were drinking little machines. Number 10, it was the evolutionist Charles Darwin who saw these vampire bats firsthand and their blood-drinking behavior. He published the first documents on the creature in 1890, the same year that author Bram Stoker started his research for the vampire creation known as Dracula. So you're starting to see wolf, bats, blood drinking. There's a lot of this lore that's been around for, I mean, eons and eons. Number 11, but doing Stoker's research, uh, it was a book that really caught his fascination called Land Beyond the Forest. This sparked his imagination. And when you translate it into English, that title becomes Transylvania. Transylvania is now part of Romania, as Bill has said. 
and he discovered the area was steeped with old tales of vampire-like creatures like Nosferatu, uh, which they were called the blood drinkers that were human-like. Their bite could turn others into vampiric creatures of the dead like themselves. Then, of course, there was the greatest inspiration of real life, the tyrant, the superhero, whatever you want to call him, Vlad Dracula, or Vlad the Impaler, that would also intertwine into his story. Originally, he had the vampire character named Count Wumpier, but it was so taken by the, the Dracula character, Vlad, the uh, Order of the Dragon, the character would be changed to Dracula. Well, I was going to say, I believe Wumpier is a, a regional... Uh, just just a regional name for vampire somewhere in that area. Generic. So yeah. that would have, yeah, I mean, it's literally just Count Vampire. <laughs> Count Vampire. Brom was already quite taken with the research that he had accomplished in the seven years and around the countryside of Transylvania especially. Now he had the real-life blood drinker with a historical accurate genealogy kind of in the same area. It was a match he felt made in heaven or some may say made in hell. Now, back in the 14th and 15th century, the area later known as Romania was a very quiet, old-fashioned area steeped with rumors of mostly uneducated working people. This led to much superstition. And so when someone accused another of being a witch or a vampire, it was often taking very literal to the point that even the dead were dug up. And when they did this, it was before, you got to keep in mind, any embalming had been discovered or done. So these corpses would often have bloated full faces. Their hair and nails may have continued to grow even now, after death. I, I knew you were going to say that. Hair and nails do not actually continue to grow. And I read that. That is, is the constriction of bo- the body as the body shrinks retracts and gives yeah, the illusion it, it gives the illusion that the fingernails and the hair have grown so i knew that was going to come up well but stated yeah, good they, point they they look that way also victims of tuberculosis you know it, it which is, is in essence a wasting disease but any disease that caused a person to waste away you know as you were weakened day after day over time I mean, that, that seemed to emulate what they believe was the depredations of the vampire would sneak in and, and take a little bit of your life every night. And so people that died of, of diseases similar to that were often treated as vampire victims. Wow. Sometimes when they would dig up these bodies, of course, without the embalming process, internal organs begin to rot, obviously, the quickest. And that would often have blood that would come up through the mouth and people would dig up these dead bodies. And again, uneducated people they saw the illusion of longer nails and and stuff but blood coming out of their mouth like they had just fed upon someone you'll have to forgive me as you say uneducated working i think of of blazing saddles you know these are (laughs) simple uneducated working class people of the earth you know morons morons (laughs) now to help ensure Uh, These creatures of the night, we'll call them vampires, were kept at bay in the ground. Several things were a common practice. We touched briefly upon these. But number one, the decapitation of the head. In doing this, it was believed by separating the head from the body, this would prevent this demon from being able to feed anymore and it would essentially die. Uh, Number two, we talked about the oak stake. Some goes back to fashioning of a similar from the oak cross in which Christ was crucified. And well, it was, and it was intended to pin them to the grave in which they were buried. So they couldn't get back up. It wasn't necessarily like what we see in the movies, just a, you know, an eight inch stake and a hammer through the heart. Which would kill anybody. So yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Um, But no, in some of the old sketches and accounts, I actually found where they would unbury the body, leaving the the grave exposed, and then cut an oak tree to have the branches fall down and penetrate the body, as Bill was saying to that that point, piercing the body in multiple locations to the ground itself. And that would be able to justify, allow the spirit to go ahead and die in peace and and kill the vampire in, in essence. Now, during this time of pagan superstitions, uh, the church, or more so, I should say, the symbols of the church were also used to help keep the demons and vampires at bay. And this is where we get the cross or the crucifix that we we see in some of the corny old original movies uh, where they're 
you know, away with you, vampire, and holding a crucifix and, and you know, this type of deal. <laughs> There's a, oh, it's a, it's a, it's a vampire movie. I don't know where it's from. I've seen just the little clip where the guy holds out the, the cross, you know, and he's like, oh, back vampire, back. And the vampire's like, oh, yeah, but I'm Jewish. <laughs> so he swaps it out for a star of David. The member's like, oh, no. Oh, no, not that. Now, kind of the ironic twist, I'll wrap things up here, of events. The, the author and creator of Count Dracula, uh, Bram Stoker, would unfortunately die a poor and humble man. Now, one little detail. You want to bring this back home? Bring it back home. We always like to have connections to Missouri. Okay. Now, you, no doubt, are familiar with Samuel Langhorn Clemens. Oh, yes. If you are born and raised in Missouri, you, you should know him. You've probably taken a class on him. Hannibal, Missouri. And you might call him Mark Twain. You might. At some point in his lifetime, I know Mark Twain buddied up with Bram Stoker, and they invested in uh, printing presses. And um, if most people know, you, you talk about Bram Stoker dying, not a rich man. Um, basically, the only thing that Mark Twain owned when he passed away was the bed he died in. So, obviously, they... Kind of a stereotypical... It wasn't a lucrative career in printing presses for the two of them, but I, I just... I, I took a college course on Mark Twain, and that was one of the details that I learned, that he and Rom Stoker were actually associated with I actually one was not aware of that, so... That yeah, was apparently, like I said, it uh, uh, took took some money and invested in printing presses and did not work out as well for them they were as just it should have. Way ahead of their time. Way ahead of their time. But yeah, Dracula was the eighth of 17 books actually written and penned by Bram Stoker, uh, none of which really made money before his death. Uh, and again, as we talked about, that seems to be kind of similar or typical, I should say, with a lot of the authors. The man who possibly, with a possible twisted mind, gave us undoubtedly the world's most well-known character uh, of this genre would die without ever realizing or knowing his own legacy. Well, what is it he, uh, I think you, you touched on this earlier, Dracula features in more fiction, movies, TV shows, books, whatever, than, than almost any other fictional character. I think Sherlock Holmes comes in second. Yeah. So, you know, Dracula is arguably one of the most known fictional characters. And again, like I said earlier, he appears in Marvel Comics, in DC Comics, in, in all sorts of, of books all sorts of movies, you know, the, the legacy of Dracula, whether that is Vlad the Impaler or Bram Stoker's, you know, vampire, I, I just very, very far reaching. Very, very. Well, we hope that you have enjoyed this tale of children of the night and vampires. It's just another example of what you'll find on Nightmares on the Lost Highway. We'd like to give a shout out to our first uh, paying sponsor, Raven's Loft. That's our family shop here located in uh, London, Missouri. It's your one-stop gaming, vintage toy, and collectible shop where you can find Star Wars, Transformers, G.I. Joe, comics, vinyl records, role-play gaming, Magic the Gathering, and so much more. We're located here at 223 West Commercial, downtown Lebanon, and also in our second location, uh, also here in Lebanon, at the Heartland Antique Mall. We'd like to thank Ravensloft for, again, supporting Nightmares on the Lost Highway. I want to take a time to thank the people that helped bring this all together. Uh, Alex Tudor, you can almost call him our producer at this point. Sarah Tudor, who also helps with some of the technical stuff. I want to take a moment to extend thanks to Eric for letting us use his space to record in kind of our makeshift studio. I, in turn, would like to thank Bill for, one, putting up with me and uh, using this camaraderie to do something we both very much love and enjoy doing, and thank Bill's family for allowing him to spend all the time to work and clean up our recordings and present them in what uh, you hear in the final uh, terms, uh, the final edition, if you will. Um, and I'd like to thank all of you for continuing to, to listen. I know we've got some loyal followers out there. We do this as a labor of love, but we're, we're happy that there are people that enjoy it as, hopefully as much as we do. Thank you very much.